So it's, it's my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Lunch and Learn speaker, Doug Prost. Doug is our acquisitions uh, expert here at TGS Calgary, and he's going to be talking about fiber size acquisition in the Alberta woodlands, comparing fiber size to, to dynamite. Um, Doug brings a really unique blend of practical field experience and knowledge of geophysics to the table, so I think you'll really enjoy listening to him talk. Uh, we're, he's going to be interrogating a few different areas in uh, uh, wood, woodland areas in Western Canada. Uh, he'll be focusing primarily on the car on a cardio plane near Great Valley, but he's also going to uh, flirt with a couple other areas, the Duvernay up by Fox Creek, and also uh, some some Montney stuff. And uh, the, the final comment I'll make, because I don't want to steal his, his thunder, but one really cool thing about this particular talk, in my opinion, is he examines the efficacy of one of these load well sweeps, where you use a vibe and you shake for a long time at the loads to try to get low frequency signal. And down in Oklahoma, this technique has been published, and uh, they reported some great success. So uh, Doug was really curious what would happen up here, and I'm not going to answer that question for you. I'll just let him do his, do his things. Doug. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to TGS. Um, source selection within Alberta Woodlands, that's an important statement um, for, uh, and a title for the talk, being that uh, being that uh, uh, regulations between different provinces and within green area and white area um, can be quite different. So this is specifically within the woodlands talking about green area acquisition. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out is that this area is all woodlands. There's no open grass um, to add extra vibe sources, add increased density, any line or any source piece of, or any piece of source equipment, whether it's be dynamite or vibe or size, and receiver deployment will all have to be cut um, via mulchers. Um, the, so with that, um, I'm going to go through some general topics really fast about the operations portion of it uh, to get into the meat and potatoes, which is some of the survey density and how we try to achieve higher uh, trace density, and then also and then kind of the, the real key, which is the which is the data itself of the CD case study that we ran within the uh, within the Great Valley area. The fundamental driver for this uh, particular test was the dense. Uh, mature infrastructure of the oil and gas field that, fields that are there and the drilling restrictions for source. We're looking at three meter depth um, restrictions to six meters, which will really uh, hinder our ability to put a heavier charge size in the ground and get that better penetration of the dynamite source. Um, versus what would necessarily be the vibrator setback distances um, for a non explosive source, which if I quickly toggle back and forth, you can see reduction and the increase in surface area we have for source deployment. A key for us to avoid as many setbacks and as many gaps as we possibly can. Um, line construction is the uh, is a major cost and is an a, 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 a absolute requirement in this area. We believe both the receiver and the source line need to be cut primarily for um, the receiver line, at least on the on the one side, is for the HSC concern of uh, evacuating personnel, and uh, furthermore for uh, deployment of equipment. And if you end up getting a bad blow with snow, and you have um, a single point stations deployed in the in the bush, you're going to have a tough time finding them. So it really helps protect you from cost overruns. On the source side of things, with that uh, that uh, C250 mulcher. The key um, takeaways from that particular piece of equipment is that it's a 2.75 meter cut line and it has low ground pressure and it's a track vehicle, which means it could head down line in uh, rough terrain to be able to turn on a dime, just like a tank. So um, it puts that uh, those particular pieces of equipment in um, good operation ability in some of that uh, rougher area. The LIS drill, uh, most of you um, some of you uh, probably are aware, is a 2.5 meter line wide unit, also a track vehicle, also has the mobility um, benefits, um, and is a little bit lighter, for, or the, the ground pressure is a little bit lighter. So pipeline companies and uh, field managers may allow, or are more likely to allow you to cross their pipelines without putting in um, rig matting, stove bridges, all cost and time consuming um, uh, endeavors which as we get to the vibe um, um, source in that particular 
piece of equipment. You'll see that it's heavier, rubber tracked, and uh, um, it's gonna have a, a higher uh, ground, for, uh, ground force, which is gonna lead companies to ask for rig matting and um, um, ask for rig matting and snow bridges to cross pipelines, which could add cost to your overall program. So now we've cut the line, we've put the source uh, into the ground via the LIS drill. Uh, what are we gonna get out of that source signature for dynamite? And I, I found, um, after doing some research, um, shockwave theory that um, uh, models out, the, as you change mass, the, the, charge, the mass charge size, as you uh, increase the charge size, your center frequencies are actually gonna be lower. As you decrease the, the charge size, your center frequency is going to end up being higher, but the higher end and the low end, relatively, you're still getting good quality high and low ends, um, especially out of the larger charge size. So the thinking, or my thinking, um, was that originally was that the, the smaller charge size was actually giving you a higher frequency range, which from this particular piece of theory would indicate that it's just relative to the charge size or to that particular shot. <clears throat> so we wanted to replicate that particular image in a field trial. So we had conducted 15, um, 15 meter holes, nine and six meter holes where we planted varying charge size. So the only difference that we're um, changing is the charge size from two and a half kg all the way down to 150 grams. And we've isolated the first break uh, energy to see if we can get a, a reputable um, signature from the theory. And from what I'm um, showing in the amplitude spectrum, I think it's actually agreeing quite well. So now I have a, a rough idea of what I'm gonna get out of my dynamite signature. And let's explore a little bit the fiber size source and what we will be potentially gaining out of that particular piece of equipment. Low dwell frequency generation. What that means is we are spending more time with less ground force to acquire frequencies below the full drive level of that unit. The full drive, the full start drive frequency range is a mechanical limitation of that five to be able to shake at full drive level, um, which depending on your area could be 70 or 80% and um, not reach its um, equipment limitations causing phase and distortion problems. So the way that that is accomplished is a custom low end sweep where the electronics control, the electronics and vibrator control that low end, put in a low level of ground force, spends more time trying to acquire that low end frequency. In this particular uh, test, we're running down these 2.75 meter cut lines. Typically, we're using mini vibes. Mini vibes weigh in at about 18,000 pounds. We uh, found a piece of equipment called the Univibe. It's an Inova um, piece, uh, piece of equipment at 26,000 pounds. Same width, about 8, 000, 8 to 10,000 pounds heavier on, on the actual unit itself, which is going to give us more ground force and it's going to give us a, uh, a potential better return. And it's also set up, um, one of the the interesting factors about the, this particular vibe is that it's also set up with a longer mass stroke, which gives it more force on those lower end frequencies. One thing to note is it is a tired vehicle, which means um, you're going to have some um, you're going to have some potential issues with elevations. Um, I, I know they have a gradient on there; there it's 31 degrees, for, but that is for travel. When you start hitting um, side hills or slopes, <coughs> it's important in your design phase and in your modeling phase that you're trying to deviate your lines around that because it doesn't take much for a bike to be shaking on a, a small incline for it to shake down a hill or bump down a side hill. So it's important to make sure that where you're putting your BP points is fairly flat terrain. So if we look at uh, Lansing 1992, um, speaking in terms of uh, what your power spectrum might be strictly for your by sweep, there are, I have fold written in there crossed out because you can have design specifications that fit um, within that particular equation. But we're only going to worry about the number of vibes and the, the fundamental ground force because they are the, the, the major con um, contributors to improved uh, power spectrum and also um, the number of sweeps and sweep length. This is the, the methods that we use to try to build up that signal to noise quality. 
So here is what, um, if you went to a, a recording company today and you said, I would like um, for you to design me custom suites because that particular suite is proprietary to the company and that suite is particular <coughs> to that piece of vibrator. That equipment requires different drive levels at different frequency ranges. So what we're showing here is the standard linear 32 second suite. We drop down from four, three to two hertz you can see the amount of time within that suite, within that pilot suite, that you're spending on the low end frequencies. And this is all set up to achieve a flat spectrum, a flat spectrum between your uh, between the frequency band, which in the case of the black um, amplitude spectrum, that is from two to um, 110 hertz, I believe, yeah, 110 hertz. Note that as you spend more time, if you have a set, Sweet link as you spend more time on lower and lower frequencies, there is a trade off on your power spectrum. So it's something to be aware of is that as you're putting, uh, spending more time on that low dwell suite, um, you're going to end up lo um, losing a little bit on that uh, power spectrum of your overall uh, amplitude. So I wanted to take an example of the dynamite shot and the fiber size shot record and capture the same analysis that, I had, that we had done for the dynamite, um, the previous dynamite experiment, and show kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of what you might be looking at in the field. Somewhat unsettling when you're uh, pulling a record like this off the, um, you're, you're viewing it on the screen, and you're trying to justify or see the signal content within that uh, particular suite. But uh, we'll explore that a little bit more uh, in the later slides. But the main takeaway here is, is if we're if we focus on the um, refracted energy in a window base and a window mode, um, we're able to overlay the vibe and the uh, dynamite power spectrum, which we can see in the pre-stack sense that the vibe has got uh, a considerably be uh, better signal, and the low end is actually kind of comparable. So we're driving hard on the low end. But in this particular case, we're really not seeing a massive increase on the on that low on those low end frequencies. Some shots I can say have um, in the amplitude spectrum and the power spectrum, you could see some improvement on the fiber size record versus the dynamite. But it, um, but then we needed to be able to substantiate it, which is really difficult when your some of your records are that noisy. Um, this slide here is just uh, I, I'll touch on this briefly, but. Um, this is, a cost, um, this is a cost quality curve for effort versus um, the quality of your seismic data. A lot of the, um, um, a lot of the evidence and um, effort that we've seen in um, low dwell acquisition happens on the really high trace density 3D seismic programs. So we're talking um, not tens of thousands of traces per square kilometers, but hundreds of thousands and millions of um, traces per square kilometer. Which means we want to try to see, and, and some of our, our, our case study is trying to see where on that cost quality curve are we actually going to start getting that value and whether or not we need to put an absorbent amount of effort to get a return on that. Or if we can be, be able to get, a, if you were thinking of a, a, a fundamental or a basic um, run of the mill dynamite design and the cost associated with that. Could we achieve that in the fiber size world and then explore those low ends, uh, the, that low end frequency band? So, the, a lot of the case study will be strictly to kind of uh, see if we can uh, be able to achieve that and get that benefit out of the fiber size data. But uh, in order to, I can't just talk about trace density, I have to also um, or be aware that we are conscious of offset and azimuth distribution within our designs. Um, this is a, a rose diagram divided into azimuth and offset sectors, and I've kept them fairly tight just for this particular display. Um, so what I'm showing is on the left, on the right hand side is both designs are completely static in CDP bin and in receiver line and station spacing. All I've done is drop the source line space for the source um, station interval from 50 to 6.25 meters, driving an absorbent amount of fold, but I'm not closing my offset gaps, and I'm not adding a lot of richness or diversity to my azimuth. Where if I move to re uh, line reduction, in the simplest case, I'm able to close up a lot of my offset gaps, and I am adding that richness into my, my, uh, into my uh, CDG bin 
important to note that this is a 25 by 25 meter bin and the previous slide that is not the natural bin size i'm just trying to drive in as many um, shot points as i can on that particular uh, line and the, the reason why this is important is because your line construction is a heavy contributor to your cost and then if you're reducing your line construction you are moving from a low impact seismic acquisition and your as your line widths are getting wider and the, the distance separation between your lines is decreasing you're going to be flagged as a high impact seismic operation program which can add um, cost to your program and, del and time delay so before we dive too far into the, the test, we are chasing the low so we did use a DSU-3 uh, 3C digital sensor, sensor, which means that the sensitivity and the uh, phase lag are both flat on the low end. So we're not having any, uh, we're not having any um, decay on the amplitude or the phase of the, of the low frequencies that we're, that we're acquiring. We want to avoid any question of the attenuation. Although we did deploy 120 analog sensors, so that internally you can conduct some experiments on um, the ability for that analog sensor to record low end frequency. The 2D case study, and this is kind of the meat and potatoes of, uh, of the presentation. So in the yellow, you can see the um, shutout zones, the 180 meter, um, or sorry, the 180 meter um, drill or restriction areas versus the non-explosive uh, 50 meter. We have the, uh, the digital, the analog, sorry, um, the dynamite and the fiber size. Um, we laid out, so the, the, uh, the receiver um, deployment was at every 10 meters and was static for both surveys. The dynamite was deployed every 40 meters and the fiber size was, we took a, a VP every uh, 10 meters. So we were looking for a four to one ratio and we're staying within that four to one ratio because in a bare earth design with, um, with putting into the, uh, the acquisition rate improvements with fiber size acquisition, we believe that we could roughly achieve a one-to-one -one cost ratio for the four-to-one source effort versus the, the uh, atypical dynamite acquisition. Um, some, some context into the fold that we're driving into the ground on the fiber size um, world. We're at a 80 to 200 fold in between um, 1,000 and uh, 2,000 meters offset. The dynamite, we're in a 25 to 60 fold level. And again, I'm speaking in a VP, uh, SP, uh, shot point to, or, B, or five point to shot point ratio has that four to one. We only achieved a three, uh, three to one ratio in practice. It was, we did not do infill shots or in, infill VPs, which means we had a reduction in our actual um, uh, final five count. Here we go, CDP sorted, pre-stack shot gathers, and this is what we originally looked at coming straight out of the field. So this was uh, something that when you first see it, to be perfectly honest, and you're in the field and getting ready to acquire a, a, a 2D or a 3D program, you're, oh my God. When you, there's not a lot of signal. The first breaks are, are look pretty tattered, and when you compare that to the dynamite record, I'm like, why the heck would I ever do anything else? Um, and we stepped, uh, we ran some filter panels um, on the very low end, looking at the four to six hertz range that, um, and the zero, or the zero to four and the 10 to four hertz range. And really what we're trying to see is just in the raw pre stack sense, can we see any signal out of either one of them? Dynamite as expected, um, we're not getting down in, in or much below that five or six hertz range. And uh, fiber sites where we spent a good chunk of that sweep time trying to the sweep parameter, by the way, was uh, 3 hertz to uh, 110 hertz. And we spent a good chunk of time driving in those low frequencies, taking our time with it, controlling the equipment, making sure that we're, we're handling our distortion and our phase errors correctly. And um, so we we're hoping to see something in the field that would give us the indication that we're doing a good job. As we step it into the, uh, the 10 hertz range, the 0 to 10 hertz range, we're still struggling to see some signal in either one, either one of them, quite frankly. So we stepped up um, the, uh, the scalers just to see if we could blow out the signal at all. And I think you can see that the dynamite is, is starting to show that signal quality, where the fiber size is really still scaring me. Like it's, there's not a lot of signal down there. 
the noise level is quite high, and we're not getting, seeing a huge return on, the, on that individual fiber size record. So just for that sanity check, what we're gonna, what we do is we kind of grab that dominant frequency range of that 20 to 55 hertz, and we're just, um, we'll run that comparison to see if the fiber size, the dynamite, if the fiber size is rendering any signal, and we are seeing some return in that dominant frequency range. So we know we're getting some signal into the ground, it's just very, very weak. Stack sections, so here's the, 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 uh, the dynamite example, and I'll, these are completely, there's no filter applied to these. I have <coughs> AGC them, uh, I've done a rolling window AGC just to balance out the, the amplitudes in them. But I'll, I'll toggle back and forth so you can see the difference of the vibe versus the dynamite. Just the vibe, <coughs> dynamite. <coughs> vibe, dynamite. Vibe, dynamite. I'm liking um, what's happening about one second and above. What's happening down in the deeper from um, <coughs> zero to, to two seconds. A little less so. There's a little. There's a lot more noise in the in the in the fiber size, and it was considerably weaker. We're having problems with penetration. Um, uh, probably something that's important to note is that we used two univibes within the sweep. We did not do a single univibe sweep. We ran two. We were going to uh, attempt. Um, we were going to attempt a three, uh, or we did some testing with a three vibe setup. It does add a, a value to it. But access to equipment and the ability to move three vibes down a line can be somewhat problematic. So what we were hoping to for is that we were gonna push the limits and try to see if we could get some good quality signal out of the two, uh, two vibe setup. The interesting part is that even in the 2D case where we have some, uh, where we don't really have the diversity of azimuths and offsets that we would like to have, and seeing the quality of the vibe size <laughs> record, we're still rendering a, a fairly decent uh, uh, image. So, the meat and potatoes, what we spent all of that time doing in the vibe size low dwell suite, all the time planning um, our acquisition, is what that low end frequency range looks like. So, in this particular slide, this is the dynamite 10 hertz um, filter panels, and we focused on the low, stepping out of what we know is good quality signal and into the lower dwell frequency range. This is the dynamite, obviously is the dynamite record. And we're seeing down to the 10, 8, and 6 hertz range, um, seeing some good quality um, interpretable amplitudes at, the, at those levels. And as I move to the, the fiber size um, world, we spent a lot of that time working on those low end, low dwell frequency but it's um, very erratic and irregular, and it's hard to say that that is true signal. We're getting higher amplitude. I think that's, that's worth saying. But the actual coherent signal that's coming through is still heavily contaminated with noise. So we're, on this particular test, we're, I think we're kind of missing the, uh, that low end frequency range, which we were really hoping that with that heavier unit and adding the units that we would, or, you know, and the increased sweep length time, that we would have been able to really substantiate that low end frequency band. So it's not an easy target to hit when you're limited in your ability to um, drive through trace density um, and um, not have a lot of ground to work with, surface ground to work with. Another comment I, I will make is that. Um, one of the conceptions is, is that the fiber side or the dynamite is always going to have a higher um, frequency band than the, vibe, than the fiber side record. But in this particular implication, I think they're actually quite comparable. There is some residual noise left in that fiber side record. We haven't done any work to really substantiate where that noise is coming from, but we do know that the signal. Um, quality is roughly petering out in and around that 70, maybe the 80 hertz range. But if I compare back and forth, the dynamite and fiber size at the high end is um, aligning quite nicely. So just so that we're not uh, looking at a, a, a slick segment and we have a, an analysis of the full section, the box is where I took my sample, so the, filter, the previous filter panels, and I'm gonna walk down into that four hertz range. 
And the, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to track that coherent signal all the way down to that four hertz range. So here's a 10 hertz for the dynamite, eight hertz, still pretty nice, and then six hertz could be in there, but not overly pickable, probably not overly usable. And if I drop all the way down to the four hertz, then this is um, kind of just background noise at this point. Um, interesting is if we look at the virus size at the 10 hertz range, we actually have a lot of noise that's, um, that's um, interfering with our signal quality. And at 10 hertz, at this time, we're in full drive level. Here's at eight hertz. So we're still at full drive level of the vibe. Six hertz. So now we're getting below the full drive level of the vibe and at four hertz. More amplitude, but really quite unorganized still. And then finally, it uh, take some time just to kind of substantiate um, the high end in that full section view of the uh, filter panel. So this is the 7080 for the dynamite. That is the, or, sorry, that is the, the 6070 for the dynamite. And that is the 6070 for the fiber size. Some nice signal quality in there. And then we step into the 70, 80 hertz range. This is the dynamite. And that's the fiber size. So this work was all conducted in, in a 2D sense, single line, single acquisition, overlaying source and re receivers, adding that four to one VP to SP ratio, uh, and really trying to drive in those low dwell frequencies. And in this particular area, it, it proved to be a little bit more difficult than we were thinking it was originally gonna be, and we didn't end up with the results that we were hoping for. On Dawson 3D, which is this particular experiment here, we have a lot more open ground, or sorry, experiment, but 3D acquisition um, that's in processing right now. We were able to kind of step up our game a little bit. We were able to um, deploy the four to one ratio, able to reduce our line, our line width, which is gonna give us um, a richer azimuth and offset distribution, employ us a, a large 64,000 pound vibrator. Um, we ran some model frequency um, tests in order to investigate that low end frequency range and only that particular range. So stepping from the, from the full drive operating um, level of that vibe down through each um, frequency range, slowly uh, dropping the drive level to see what kind of return in an uncor or uncorrelated world we'll be getting on the, on the actual data. We did a detailed slip sweep analysis to um, um, accompany our, our our efforts in the processing center to develop a uh, uh, harmonic, de harmonic denoising tool, and we've caused severe harmonic contamination. We ran this pro uh, program slip sweep, which, uh, and but we, for the time being, we've stayed out of the harmonic range until such time that we've developed that uh, particular algorithm. And we did a low dwell acquisition for um, all the way down to four hertz. So in the three D sense. We're just putting our toes in the water on this one, just because once you go from four hertz to three hertz, there's a significant drop in your drive level. So, and we also are using an analog phone on this one. So on the analog phone, that roll off from that four hertz down into that the three, two, and one is significant. So we'd have a tough time really being able to substantiate the quality of the, the, the one to three hertz range with that analog phone. And then finally, there is dynamite data located directly or basically in the middle of that particular program. Um, and we're going to use that to continue that, um, that pre-stack comparison. And we're tying into an existing program um, to the west, which we're going to use um, for the, uh, the post-stack time migrated analysis in order for us to try to substantiate that frequency content, um, the high and the low end, and whether or not we're achieving a better low end and maintaining the same high, length, high end uh, as the dynamite uh, source that we're using in the, typically use in that area. Um, so finally, uh, uh, just a, a summary of a, a few statements. Um, unbeknownst to me, there, the, uh, the shockwave theory was able to be reproduced and um, 
um, um, reproduced in field trials. So we're, we took the theory, we applied it into the, into the field, and got some um, fairly agreeable results. Um, line construction, um, your width and distance separation of your lines is going to be that key that's going to drive you from low impact seismic into high impact seismic. I'm not going to debate whether or not high impact seismic is going to add you more value, because it is, and you're probably going to be in better shape for your low end frequencies, high end frequencies, spatial sampling, everything. But the key is, is that um, that impact is there, it's an environmental impact, and it is the one of the, the limiting factors for us to really be able to drive in some of those high density techniques that are happening in um, the prairies. Finally, in an apples apples to comparison, um, I think Vive does prove to be um, a, value, a valued source. It would help us mitigate drilling restrictions and also allow us to um, also allow us to get closer to, um, into some of those setback distances. Long story short though, I wouldn't, in a, in a woodland sense where I'm cutting line and I don't want to enter into the high um, impact seismic operations, I would probably stay out of that um, low end frequency and work within the full drive level of that vibrator. It just, it's going to take me too much time and I'm, and I'm having problems actually proving that I'm going to get that data value back. Um, and that being said, um, I would spend a little bit more time ensuring that I'm protecting the, the pre-stack value uh, data quality or value of my data quality, which means I can't go into the full blown, less effort, more often type acquisition. I'm going to stay, which means I'm not going to be able to spread out shots and stations wherever I want. So if I'm having to stay fairly regular, I'm going to want to make sure that I'm going to have a good or, or a nice um, recoverable um, shot record or VP record to work with. And then, uh, yeah, that ultra low frequencies is um, time consuming to obtain, um, difficult to substantiate in the field, and may need those ultra high trace densities to really realize that low end potential, to really give you that access to the, the, the edge frequencies on your low and your high end of your data set. And finally, just some um, special thanks to the TGS team that's helped me put this together. Um, and geokinetics, um, Forest Lynn is, did all of the um, custom sweep designs and helped me do the analysis in the field. And uh, Tim Carey um, from geokinetics helped me do the, uh, um, the equipment analysis and operations deployment and um, um, acquisition rate um, um, calculations to be able to determine whether or not we can achieve a one-to-one -one ratio in a, dy a typical dynamite acquisition versus a four-to-one ratio in the virus size world. So. And with that, I'll uh, take any questions or comments or, yeah, discussions that anyone might want to have. Depths were 12 meters. Yeah, 12 meters, 2 kg, single hole. Uh, was there any like uh, surface geology work done in the area? Um, not, not to my knowledge, no. Um, we did spend a lot of time in ensuring that when the drillers went through that they recorded um, the material that they were drilling into. Okay. But uh, as far as anything over and above that, I'm not aware. So, Doug, are you going to have? A 64 pound pipe for comparison on the same 2D line? Or no, um, and the reason for that is because I would have to cut the line wider. As soon as I have to uh, move that line to a 3 meter plus line width, then I'm moving into a high impact source, which means, um, or sorry, a high impact seismic acquisition program, which means my costs are going up, so now I'm completely you changing. Have it, you did have it for your actual 3D. I had it for the 3D because the 3D didn't require um, as much cut line or any cut line because a, a major portion of that um, was within was on private land, and uh, which allowed us to utilize the, the larger vibrators. Plus, as I mentioned, kind of in the uh, in the initial comments of my talk, it, this is Alberta regulations. So within the BC regulations and on private land, we're able to permit um, landowners differently than we are within uh, public land. There was some area, which we went to um, Dynamite, that was uh, 
uh, public land or government owned land and we were we did not go down to a uh, uh, we did not reduce the line widths and we didn't use vibe in those areas because and the primary reason is we didn't want to widen the cut lines in order to get vibes in so if the landowners will let you get on there and let you with the, the wider cut line then you're able to uh, utilize the larger vibes just to be clear that 3d is in the montany area so fairly far geographically away from the cardium where the 2d Test Cor correct. Required. Probably also worth mentioning that the uh, source test that we um, that we had completed for the sink, the source signature was done in Fox Creek. Did you take any uh, just on the interpretation side some well ties? Just kind of looking at you know where the Mid River Coal or some of your Glock Ellers leads. From interpretation view, the vibe versus the dynamite, and if the character was any better on one or the other, phase differences, or those are always tough to kind of get a good tie in that. So, and, uh, yeah, or I don't know, as opposed to just sort of the straight filter tests and stuff, like, as if, you know, what was the real difference as an interpreter, kind of how you do that. So, we had uh, uh, internally, we had taken it through like some general inversion work and had done some rough analysis, but we hadn't internally taken it through any sort of interpretation steps. I, I guess, yeah, just to add to that, it was, uh, we were, you know, in the test, you're looking at the full, full recorded window. Yeah. But, you know, when you're looking at something perspective, or if you're working with a particular data set, you might only look at the first two seconds. Correct. Right. So, because, um, yeah, there was a lot of high signal in the sub two, because it was a forward, of, was it a forward a second? It looked like it was four seconds. Uh, so two and a half seconds on the yeah two and a half seconds. So it was from zero to one second. You had nice signal. Yeah. Nice signal, but below that it kind of blew up in energy. Agreed. Right. So the question is, is, is the stop down there really relevant for a test in, in in the producing area? Right. Agreed. So in um, so from our perspective as a, a seismic uh, provider, yeah. um, we're interested in all depths. Yeah. Um, but the primary target is up and around that one second zone. So for the specifics of that target yeah. and vibe versus dynamite, I think there uh, you could probably work with either one and be quite comfortable. Okay. But I definitely am not an interpreter, so I'll let you guys um, make that call. Yeah, yeah. You're saying that the 3D is at the processor now? Saying. Correct. So it's in the. So we recorded it the, um, this winter, um, and it's in going through uh, processing as we speak. Expecting a, uh, a fast track volume, probably. I'm going to say farther out, which would be sometime in July or August. Any kind of early statements that you said about the filter panels you see on that, with the large data, the kind of different areas. Well, um, definitely. I can uh, definitely say that. Um, it is a surface source, so it is surface dependent. Um, but the the larger vibe um, is giving us a nicer overall signal, but also signal quality, signal to noise quality or power. But the to substantiate the low end frequencies in the pre-stack world is just, just yeah, it's just not not happening. So until we get to the point where we're in a, a post-stack migration or um, into a stack volume of some sort, it's really difficult to justify. How'd you land on 32 seconds? 32, vibes? 32 seconds. So, the way that we worked that particular scenario is we performed a running stack, which means we took short sweep windows and we ran them 32 times. So, the, the actual sweep was four seconds, and we ran 32 individual four second linear sweeps. And all we were doing was compounding the time, the 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 uh, sweep length time, and like in the receiver in the um, in the uh, in the one slide where I was showing the the cost to quality curve, what we're looking for is we're, we're looking for that cost cost to quality curve where we're spending where we're spending time and we see dramatic increase or improvements right away, but now we're spending a lot more time, but the actual physical improvement is somewhat uh, static. So we're, the more time we spend up into the, you know, up into the 60, 100, 120 seconds of sweep time, we're see, we're seeing a dramatic change or a significant change in the signal to noise quality of that pre-stack shot. So we worked it from um, where did we see that value, and then we pulled back a little bit, 
in order to allow for the acquisition rate and the fold and the trace density to kind of take hold after that. So in the, the, the optimal sweep length that we kind of saw for just that pre-stack shot was in and around 42 to 48 seconds. Anything more than that, and we we're kind of spending a lot of time and not getting a lot of value. And anything less um, um, in, the, in the, that particular piece of equipment's case in those ground conditions, anything less than that uh, probably 20 to 24 second range, um, we could have added a lot of quality or a lot of um, improvements just by adding uh, more seconds. That's Did you try multiple sweeps, single behind, or anything like that? Um, so the running stacks would have been multiple uh, sweeps. The um, we did run on, on that test once we had our, our no sorry you're at 32 seconds once you landed on that like yes yes yeah we did so we ran so we ran that particular sweep um, in a linear sense a six to one ten hertz range we ran it four times and then we ran a four three and a two um, low dwell sweep to compare the uh, shock quality from one um, from one to the other and we. Uh, we did repeat it, repeat that particular sweep multiple times in the same area. Although we didn't uh, necessarily stack them and do them in that sense. Um, yeah, so I have another thought there, but it's gone. <laughs> Anyone else? Did anyone uh, ever run a low dwell sweep? And Seen some really good su success? Depends on what your definition of good is. My, my <laughs> definition is uh, would be coherent, um, nice, or a good quality amplitude, and. Yeah, we didn't get, I'd say we were probably six hertz yeah. on the low end. Yeah. We put considerably more effort. Into the lower end frequencies into than, than, what, than what we did, yeah. or so your low dwell was even higher effort on the low dwelling. Uh, no, it's about the same, but we had a sixty-four thousand pound bike. Oh, I see. We stacked three shots or three uh, shakes per shot. Um, I can't remember what the shot spacing was. That off the top of my head, I think it was like twelve and a half meters. Um, and yeah, we did some kind of forty different tests. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, taking the time out of your day.